Okay, my topic is on laparoscopic myomectomy techniques, principles, and difficult cases. Uh, as what Chui Ling said, um, laparoscopic uh, myomectomy, open myomectomy is not a difficult case. We, all of us can do it. But somehow laparoscopic myomectomy is a technically difficult case because there are many things that we need to do when we do laparoscopic myomectomy. Now, this is my lecture outline. Firstly, I will uh, discuss of what are the problem, what are the things we need to do when you do a laparoscopic myomectomy. This is my YouTube channel. Uh, and if you, all the videos that I'm showing here, most of them are already on the, on the channel. So I'm just going to show clips of little bit clips of all these uh, procedures that I'm going to discuss. So now when we look at uh, laparoscopic myomectomy, there are a few things. First of all, we need to devascularize the uterus. Then we need to make an incision on the uterus and we need to enucleate the fibroid. Next, we need to repair the uterus and then we need to remove the fibroid. So there are a lot of things to do. And I, this is one operation that is very, it's not difficult, but very tedious. And uh, in my uh, outline, I'll be talking about some of the challenges in performing laparoscopic myomectomy. The first is large fibroids. Second is location of the fibroids. Third is how not to lose your fibroids, how to locate the fibroids in the uterus, uh, uh, problems with previous myomectomy, Virgo intacta patients, what you do when you have bleeding during surgery, and what to do when your mosculature is not working. So let's first go on to uh, devascularize the uterus. Now, I think Dr. Chua mentioned some of the things that I'm going to mention. Uh, first of all, the way to devascularize the uterus is vasopressin is very useful. Uh, ligating the uterine artery, some of which has already been discussed in the previous lecture, and also a new technique that I've developed, which is using the Foley's catheter to devascularize the uterus. So let's go on to the first one, which is use, using vasopressin. Now, there are many ways of injecting vasopressin. This is one technique that I saw about 10 years ago in Germany. And what I do is I will dilute 20 units of vasopressin in 200 cc of saline, and then I just inject in the junction between the fibroid and the uterus and just one puncture and then inject all 200 if I can into that spot. Many people, what they do is they inject all over the place. They inject a little bit here, a little bit there. And that is all right. That's another way of doing it. But this is an easy and good way of doing it. The advantage is that you don't have leakage of uh, this vasopressin from other spots, just one spot. And also you have this big advantage of this vasopressin and water going in between your fibroid and then devascularizing the fibroid and also do some kind of dissection for you. The aim of this uh, vasopressin is not to devascularize the fibroid, but to devascularize the uterus. You must remember that you want the uterus to be not bleeding and this, will, uh, this works very well. Even for large fibroids, this works very well. So this is my actually preferred and favorite technique. The second technique is ligating the uterine arteries. Uh, there are many ways of doing it. This is one technique. This technique was shown to me by Dr. Rakesh Sinha. What he does is that he just looks at the, uh, look at the uterine artery. And when you look at the uterine artery, the ascending branch of the uterine artery, and he just ligates it there. We can actually do this. He just ligates it there. He just uses and just uh, uh, go through uh, 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 around that fibroid. You may have some bleeding, but the bleeding will usually stop when you tie the uh, knot. So this is one technique. Sometimes I do this when I cannot get to the uterine artery at its origin. So this is a way in which I can get away getting the uterine artery. And once you have ligated this, you can go and do the same thing on the other side. So this is permanent ligation of the uterine artery. Um, it's actually uh, the, the blood supply to the uterus is so good that actually it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Your, your vascularization will not be affected. The other method is, of course, tying the uterine artery at its origin. It was described earlier. You can do a permanent tie. You can dissect the uterine artery at its origin and then tie it permanently. I've been doing this for years. And uh, so you just uh, tie it and then proceed on to your uterine artery. You don't have to remove the, the, the knot. And, uh, and I usually put just one suture, and that one suture will give me good, uh, good devascularization of the uterus. So this is another technique. Another technique is clipping the uterine artery. So what you can do is actually you can clip this the uterine artery at its, uh, at its origin. You have to dissect the uterine artery and then you put a clip onto it. And this clip is this a clip and you just uh, place a clip on the uterine artery. And you can, uh, once you have clipped it, you can go, and this is a clipping done. And then this clip is placed. And then you can go to the other uterine artery and clip it. And the advantage of this is that 
at the end of the surgery, you can actually remove this clip. It, it can be, it look, it may look, we see the uterus is already white. It may look a little bit frightening, but you actually slip this whole thing out. I mean, if it bleeds, then you can just tie it up because you already dissected it out. And see, the vascularization is very good. So you can do this. You can clip and remove the clips. So this is another method. So the other method is uh, temporary ligation of uterine artery. I think Dr. Chua showed very nicely, but this is another technique. This is actually described by... The, the, uh, let me just uh, reduce this uh, sound. Sorry, I, I, I cannot remove the sound from here. Sorry, I'll just go down. This, the technique is the same as what uh, uh, shown by Dr. Chua. I didn't know that a Taiwanese doctor has already described this as well. So basically, the, it's the same thing here. I'm not using the suture, but I'm using the same technique in which we make a shoelace uh, knot. Uh, this has been published in the uh, JMAC. Uh, I don't know whether who did it first, the Taiwanese doctor or this This story. It's, it's done by Dr. Sankish uh, Pisat. And you can ligate both sides and then do the surgery. And then you can and then you can actually remove the the this uh, this knot at the end of the surgery, as what's shown just now. Then you can just pull. Okay, so you can just pull on the on the knot and, and then it, it can come out. So this is another technique that you can do. It's described as a shoelace technique. So the next technique is a Foley scatter technique. So in this case, you see, when we do open, open laparoscopy, laparoscopy Sorry about the sound. I, I didn't realize that. Uh, it, it, so what 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 we, what we do is in open surgery we can actually ligate 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 the the uterine artery. Uh, we can we use a Foley's catheter and. But what what I did is I brought in a Foley's catheter into the abdomen. Okay, and then uh, make a tie around this. Uh, uh, make, make, uh, just make a knot. The only problem is how to keep this knot taut. That was the biggest headache. So what, what I did is I, so if you do this, then you can actually get a very, so you repeat it on either side. So what you are doing is actually, you are actually So then you can, so you can see that it, it, it devascularized and then we can then suture and then later we can take out that. So this is another method. Uh, this, I, I did it because this patient, uh, we couldn't uh, use vasopressin. There was some heart rhythm problem. So we used to follow I've done a few of this. So this can be uh, something that you can, you can try. Okay, the next question is how to make an incision on the uterus. Now, most of us are operating, say a right-hander, you, you either do ipsilateral suture or you're doing a midline suturing. Now, to make a midline incision, it is, it is the most difficult uh, incision to suture from, uh, from the sides. So my preferred uh, incision is actually an oblique incision. If you can make an oblique incision, your, your instruments come parallel to this and you can actually suture this very well. Transverse incision is also all right. If you're a left-hander, then you may want to do an incision this way. Never do a midline incision if you're possi if possible, because a midline incision is a very difficult incision to suture laparoscopically. So this is my advice. So now this is, uh, this is uh, enucleation of the uterine fibroid. Now, one advice I would give is to make a liberal incision on the uterus. If you make a small incision, you will struggle. And you can use this myoma screw or myoma, myoma spiral. I usually sometimes use two myoma screws to enucleate. So you can use these myoma spirals and you can put it in and then you can put a second one and then you can enucleate. So enucleation, uh, important points are make a liberal incision and then use myoma spiral as an adjunct to um, remove the fibroid. So you see here, I'm using two my myoma screws. 
This is another case that uh, did some years ago. The myoma screw, because it's used so much, it can actually break. In this particular particular case, the myoma screw broke. You see, it can it, it can break. So this can happen. Uh, so a myoma spiral is a very good uh, instrument to have when you're doing uh, laparoscopic uh, myomectomy. Okay, let me know. Go on to enucleation of the fibroid. Now, most of us may use a, a blunt dissection to enucleate the fibroid, but I would advise using sharp dissection. Now, this is a case that I'll be showing this afternoon. And uh, so here, what, what, we, what, we'll need, what we will do, what I do is this patient has actually received GNRH to uh, shrink the fibroid because it was a large fibroid. So use a scissors uh, to uh, do sharp dissection if you cannot see the areas very clearly. So this is another advice that I'll, I'll use, use sharp dissection. Now, this is a, a technique that one of my friends, uh, Dr. Wu, has actually told me. That is, you use the methylene blue in the cavity. So when, when you have a fibroid that is involving the, uh, the submucous area, how do you know that uh, where is the, uh, the endometrial cavity? So this doctor actually advised that when you are doing this kind of surgeries, you could actually inject some methylene blue into the uterus to fill up the uterus so that you can see it. So this particular fibroid was extending from the subserous to the submucus. So I want to try and avoid it. And you can see when you inject the methylene blue into the cavity, you can actually see the, the, the endometrium. And then you can try and avoid opening up the endometrium. In this particular case, I couldn't because a lot of the fibroid was all, already in the submucus area. So I actually had to cut into the submucus area. But this is another trick that will be very useful when you are not sure about whether what you're cutting is the fibroid or the submucous area to avoid going into the cavity. So like this case, I, I, I have no choice, so I have to cut into the endometrial cavity. So this is another trick that I will uh, I would like to uh, show you all that it is very easy to do and it can be very useful when doing uh, laparoscopic surgery. Okay, let me move on to uh, repairing the uterus. Now, uh, I think most of our time, besides doing morselation, will be spent on the repair of the uterus. So what are the principles of repairing the uterus? Your incision on the uterus will determine how easy it's going to repair the uterus. As I told you all, if you make a good incision, you will be enjoying your suturing. If you make a poor incision, then you are going to suffer when you, when you repair. Try not to leave any dead space. This is especially so if the patient is going to get pregnant. So try to obliterate all dead space and make, make an, all the attempt to not leave any dead space so that there won't be any blood, clot, blood uh, uh, collected in this dead place. Close in layers. There are some doctors, especially from India, they close in just one layer, everything in one layer, mass closure. I don't like it. When I open, I close in layers. So in, in laparoscopy, I close in layers. So if, it's, if the endometrial cavity is open, I'll close the endometrial cavity. Then I'll close the myometrium. Then I'll close the serosa, sometimes in four layers if necessary. So and uh, when using normal suture, say a, 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 a vicral or, a, a, or one of the polyglactin suture, it's preferable to do interrupted suture than continuous suture. This I learned from uh, experience. If you do continuous sutures, it's going to get loose. You don't have the ability like in open surgery for somebody to hold it tight. So use interrupted sutures. And I usually use a figure of eight suture. You get a figure of eight sutures tied up, figure of eight tied up. You get very good hemostasis and you have very tight suture. So never do uh, uh, continuous sutures when you're using normal sutures, not for barbed sutures. The beauty of barbed sutures is that, that for that you can use continuous sutures. Now, this is a controversy whether you want to use barbed sutures at the serosa. I'm always worried to use barbed sutures on the serosa because I'm always worried that something, one spike may be pointing upwards and it will hold on to the bowel. You can choose this in the, in the afternoon when I'm uh, showing you all the video. I'll show how I use barbed suture at the serosa. Always use anti additions after closure because as I'll store data, the worst additions are the ones with previous myomectomies. If you go in for a case with previous myomectomies and there's no anti-additions, the additions can be, can be really bad. Now, in closure, we have got a lot of barb sutures. The, the first barb suture that came up to the market was uh, VLOC, and then uh, we have Stratafix, which is actually Quill before, and Stratafix have come up with different, different types of uh, 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 sutures. I've, I've been using VLOC for a long time, and I've now moved on to a, a Stratafix. Basically, the reason is I've got a wide variety of choices, and the needles are actually very strong. 
the needle for the uh, for the start effect is very strong, so I like them. And here, this particular needle, something that I would like I, I like to use, I will show this in the afternoon. It has got 72 inches of length, and you can usually literally suture everything with this. And I will show you because it has got two two sides, two needles on either sides, and you can use that. This is another barb suture that you can use. It's a barb suture that's similar to VLOC. So using barb sutures will make your surgery very, very nice. So I will not talk about suturing here because I've got an afternoon session where I'll spend a lot of time suturing, but I'll give you all one advice. When you have this kind of uh, uh, incisions, you have a deep uh, intramural fibroid. You can see the endometrial cavity here, and you can see that the incision is actually very narrow. I've already taken out the fibroid. Uh, putting in a barb suture here can be quite difficult because when you take the first stitch, then when you're taking the second stitch, you may not get into the right space. So one advice I would give you all is to do interrupted sutures. Now, that's what I'm showing here. What I'm doing is I'm taking uh, four interrupted sutures, but I don't tie them first. This is the first interrupted suture. You take the suture and you don't tie it. You leave it open, uh, leave it, and then you go on to the next suture in the other angle. In this particular case, I put in four, four sutures two on either side and two in the center, and then you close. In that way, you get to the exact space. So this is another, another trick that I've learned over the years, that if you think that your, your continuous suture may not work, you can use interrupted sutures, but don't tie them, and then tie them at the end when you have put in all the stitches. And here you see when you tie, you get a very good closure of this, uh, this defect. So interrupted sutures, uh, separated interrupted sutures when you have narrow and deep spaces. Okay, let me see about removal of the fibroids. Now, there are many ways of removal of the fibroids. You can use power mosellation, you can do caldotomy, you can do mini laparotomy, you can cut it to small pieces. I'll quickly go through all this. All these are on my webpage. This is uh, power mosellation using a bag. This is, the, advanced, this is the, the preferred technique. Try to put it in a bag and then uh, morselate, but unfortunately it is not easy. I use this bag called a more safe bag. Now this bag is just first of all brought it in, it's rolled and then brought it in, then you need to unroll the bag. Once you have unrolled the bag, then you have to place the fibroid into the bag and then bring the mouth out of the abdomen. Once you have brought the mouth out of the abdomen, then the next step is actually the tail need to be brought out. You need to bring out the tail through the umbilical port. Once that is done, then you place the troca inside this, uh, this sleeve. And this, this part is one of the parts that I find it very difficult. The video of how to do this is on my YouTube channel. Uh, uh, and, and then once, it's, once you're in, then the mosellation is nice. It's, it's a nice procedure to do because you don't have to worry about all the small chips and all these small chips can then be brought up. So now this is how it looks at the end. This, this end can be tied up and then we can then pull this out. Okay, we can just pull this out. Okay, all right. So this is power mausolation. Next is to do a caldotomy. This is a good technique to learn. And uh, I, I would uh, strongly advise everybody to learn this. Now here I'm making a caldotomy. I put in a, a small tube in the vagina and then making a caldotomy. My advice is actually don't do this because the, the nearer the incision is to the cervix, you get a smaller incision. Try to make it lower down so that you have a more liberal hole. This hole is usually very narrow because the uterosacral ligaments are there. And once you have done that, then you can put the fiber in there and then pull it out of the caldotomy. And then the, the caldotomy can be either sutured vaginally if it, is, if it is easy vaginally, or you can do laparoscopically and, and remove it. Sometimes what happens is you have big fibroids and then you want to uh, remove through a caldotomy. So this is a, a large fibroid. This fibroid is not going to come out through the caldotomy. So what I, I have to do is I have to actually cut it. I usually use a knife to cut it. It looks frightening, but I've been doing it for years. So there's no problem. You can learn this. You cut it into small pieces and you maybe cut it into two or three pieces and then you can hook it up with a, a, a suture and then you can pull it out through the vagina. In this particular case, I'm using a ball. This ball is uh, from India. And through the ball that you can actually put in an instrument uh, and this is a 10 millimeter spoon. You can then pick up this uh, suture and then you can pull it up and you can see that it can come out. You need to learn practice. It's not as easy as you think and you can struggle. Uh, this is sometimes where after doing a surgery for two and a half years, you just want to just mosellate it. Uh, so this is a large fibroid. So caldotomy is a very good technique, especially for small fibroids. 
Next is performing a mini laparotomy. Now, uh, uh, because of this problem of morselation, many people have switched to mini laparotomy. Uh, this is one mini laparotomy that I did many years ago. And unfortunately, this patient actually got infected, the wound got infected. So when you do a mini laparotomy, I would urge you all to put it in a bag, any form of bag, and then do it within the bag. If you can put in an Alexis retractor, put one of the retractors that will protect this wound and you will have a lesser chance of uh, wound infection. So these are advice I do if you want to do a mini laparotomy. Some people do a routine mini laparotomy to remove their fibroids. Another technique is if you have small pieces and you don't want to do a colorotomy and you don't want to use a mosculator, then you can actually bring in a knife and cut it into small pieces. I do this for small, small fibroids. Uh, what I do is and then I put it in a bag and then I remove it from a bag. Another method is actually to use this instrument called Irby Bisect. This is a very good instrument. And you can use a bisect because this is a bipolar uh, cutting. You don't need the fibroid to be in contact with the uterus. If you use a monopolar, then you have to have the, uterus, the fibroid in contact with the uterus when you're cutting. Uh, so, and that can be quite troublesome. So this, you can cut it into small pieces. Say you have a small three or four centimeter fibroid and you don't want to do caldotomy or you don't want to put in a mosculator, then you can do this and then you can change your instrument to a five millimeter telescope and then pull the fibroids out through the 10 millimeter telescope. These are just uh, for thought process how to remove fibroids. Okay, let me go on to the next one. Some of the challenges in performing laparoscopic myomectomy. I think I have to rush. These are the challenges. I'm going to go through one as quickly as possible. Large fibroids. Now, uh, large fibroids are challenging. Uh, one Thing I want to tell you all is that you want to reduce the size of the fibroid when you want to before doing a laparoscopy. And I have got a lecture called Tips and Tricks in Performing Laparoscopic Surgery on a Large Uterus. It's on my YouTube channel. Some a lecture that I've given some years ago. And there are many tricks there, about 12 or 13 tricks. But using GNRH to shrink the fibroid is my favorite. Now I show you this, uh, this diagram. If you have an eight centimeter fibroid, your volume is 2,143. You have a 12 centimeter fibroid. The volume is 7,234. Can you imagine how much more this, this volume is and how much time you will spend lesser in annucleating the fibroid and also more solution? So you see, two centimeter also is double. So I am a, 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 I've got my tolerance. If a fibroid is about 10 centimeters or less, then I don't need to shrink it. I think I can do it. But if it's anything more, I will always try to shrink it. And there are two advantages of shrinking it. As I shown you, volume of the fibroid will be lesser. And also the, the fibroid will be devascularized. Because the fibroid will be devascularized, it will not bleed that much when you do the surgery. So the only problem people worry about fibroids, uh, uh, giving GNRH and unlock is that you may have difficulty in annucleating, but it's not all that difficult. I'll give you an example. This is a 43 year old doctor referred to me by another gynecologist. I saw in August, 2014, she was, her uterus was 30 week size uterus. She had already received uh, 11.25 uh, one month, uh, in Lucrine one month earlier. She wanted laparoscopic surgery. I told her I cannot do it. I want to refer to Dr. Rakesh in Mumbai. And she said, please uh, try your best. So we agreed, we gave her another Lucrine. And I saw in October, the fiber actually has shrunk to 28 week size. I gave her a second dose of Lucrine. And after that, she couldn't tolerate it. This is what, how big it was. The five, there were two fibroids. One fibroid was 15.5 times 10.21. Another fibroid was 7.7 .7 times 9.2. So I went in for the surgery. Two weeks later, she came back and then we went in for the surgery. And this is the surgery. Uh, it was a large fibroid. One thing I learned uh, over the years is that if you have a large fibroid, it is most of the time subserous. Very rarely you get an intramural or a submucous large fibroid because the large fibroid means these are patients who just kept it and didn't even know that they have a fibroid. So that's the advantage. You have subserous fibroids, how big you actually can do it. You just have to have a, uh, prepare the patient to do it. So here I took out the first fibroid and then I sutured the defect by using a VLOC suture. And after finishing uh, suturing the VLOC suture, uh, um, as I told you all, my favorite is actually to use uh, the VLOC or the barb suture on the inside and also interrupted uh, sutures, figure of eight sutures on the serosa. Once that is done, I go and remove the second fibroid. And then uh, this fibroid was then annucleated. And then uh, that defect was also sutured. So after suturing, then we have this uh, problem of mosulating this fibroid. And so once this suture is done, mosulation, this is done in 2014. At that time, bags were not a big issue. So we mosulated it without a bag. 
And so this surgery took about three hours, but the weight was almost 1.6 uh, kg. One of the bigger fibroids that I've done. So uh, next is the location of fibroids. Now, as I told you all earlier, many of the big fibroids are the subserous fibroids. And when I see a subserous fibroid, if it is even 15 centimeters, I'm not worried. I mean, it is usually easy to do. But if it's an intramural fibroid, I am very cautious because intramural fibroids are more difficult. And I had this uh, uh, un, uh, I mean, the experience of actually removing a 10, 10 centimeter intramural fibroid and then managed to do it. A single lady managed to repair everything. And actually she bled uh, during the night and into the capsule. And I had to actually go and open up and remove the his uterus. So intramural fibroids, be very careful. Now, cervical fibroids can be very difficult because of the position and also the vascularity. This is an example of a cervical fibroid. So if you have a cervical fibroid, be very careful. You want to try and tie up the uterine arteries, devascularize the uterus properly before you do the cervical fibroid. So the location of the fibroid is important in deciding whether you can handle this patient by laparoscopy. Next is losing the fibroid. So this is a video that I've done, how not to lose a fibroid. Now, the aim of, uh, uh, of uh, this is an example of a fibroid. There are so many fibroids. So what I do is I bring in a proline uh, uh, needle, straight needle this is my favorite needle. And I will then string all these fibroids first before I proceed on to the surgery. I will remove one or two first and then I'll start stringing them. And stringing them is just this way, just go through uh, uh, through and through the, the fibroid. And then you go one after another and once you have gone through another, another uh, uh, trick is that use a tenaculum, use a laparoscopic tenaculum. When you hold a laparoscopic tenaculum, you can hold a fibroid and it is easy to actually go through the fibroid. So you can go through all these fibroids. Once you have done all the fibroids, you don't want to uh, have this nightmare of losing a small fibroid. You want to try and get all the fibroids out of the way and it's all hitched up nicely on the surface and it's, you see, it's like a, like a chain and it's there. And then you can go and repair your uterus. Once you have repaired the uterus, then you can deal with the fibroid. You can remove the fibroid. So here, see what I do is I, I don't want to worry about the fibroid while I'm repairing. So once the repair is done, you can tie these uh, fibroids all together. Then you can either do a colpotomy and remove it, or you can put it in a bag and do a morselation. So, this, so try not to lose your fibroids and always chain them up before you uh, before you perform the surgery, before you uh, go on to repair the uterus. Okay, next advice is locating the fibroid during laparoscopic myomectomy. Now, one of the nightmares I have is that when I have many fibroids, I removed so many, I'm always worried that I've left behind one fibroid. And so I need to make sure that I've removed all the fibroids. So this video I, I created uh, and it's on the YouTube. There are actually several ways of doing this. So these are the ways in which to do this. The four techniques that I've described is transvaginal ultrasound during the surgery, and then transvaginal injection of methylene blue dye into the capsule of the fibroid, mini laparotomy, and intraoperative ultrasound. Now, we all know about transvaginal ultrasound. What you need to do is you need to pay, have the patient in a Trendelenburg position, place some water in the pelvis, and then do the ultrasound, and then do, do the ultrasound. The only problem with this is that what happens, uh, one, but the problem is, so the disadvantage is, so the several disadvantage. One disadvantage is if it's a Virgo intacta patient, you cannot do transvaginal, so you have to do transrectal. But the biggest problem is I cannot orientate myself uh, abdominally when I see the fibroid transvaginally. And that is the biggest problem. And then you, when you go up to the abdomen, you're not sure where to cut, make the cut. So in order to, in order to avoid this problem, I devised this method called transvaginal injection of methylene blue into the capsule of the fibroid. So what I do is I attach the probe, uh, the attachment to the probe. This is a probe that is that a lot of uh, uh, IVF specialists will have. And then what I do is I go transvaginally and I look at the fibroid and I will inject some methylene blue at the junction. You can see they can inject some junction. Then when I go back to the laparoscopy, I can see that junction. So this is an example uh, I have done. And then when I go back, I can see this blue area. Can you, can you hear the voice? Yeah, okay. Yes. So yeah, you can. So the so so the, the volume is there. So because you have in... so truly you can re listen to the my voice from the video, huh? 
No, 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 not not from the radio. Oh, not from the radio. Only my voice. Okay, right. So because I can hear that. So this fibroid, because of the methylene blue, I can then remove this fibroid. So you understand what I'm trying to say is, the the problem is you you know there's a fibroid there. You do an ultrasound, but you don't know where to cut. And if you inject this methylene blue, you can have this advantage. So another problem is when you have multiple fibroids. Uh, uh, you, you know, when we do a laparotomy, we put our hands in. So what I do is something called laparoscopic assisted abdominal myomectomy. So what I'll do is I will first do a laparoscopy and then remove all the fibroids. Then I'll make a small mini laparotomy. So after the mini laparotomy, what I will do is I will squeeze the fibroid. I will take out all the all these uh, fibroids from the mini laparotomy, and then I will squeeze the fibroid out of this mini laparotomy, and then I can then remove all the fibroids I can be removed. So these fibroids, once they are removed, and then I will then repair the uterus and then put it inside. So there are several advantages of doing this. Firstly, you it is a it is a mini laparotomy to remove all your fibroids that you have removed. Secondly, you can feel the uterus and you can also uh, feel for all the small fibroids and then you can repair it. And then thirdly, because you didn't put your hand in, uh, intra-abdominal additions will be lesser. So then you can also put in the anti-addition. So these are the advantages of this, uh, uh, what they call as mini laparotomy to remove the fibroids. The last is actually intraoperative ultrasound. Now, this, this is, a, this is an, a good technique. It is the only company that makes this uh, intraoperative ultrasound is this BK Medical. And I had, uh, 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 I had tested this, and it's very good, actually. You can then do a laparoscopy. Uh, you, can, you can do a laparoscopy, and then you can do the ultrasound. And, and once you have the ultrasound, uh, ultrasound, you can actually see the fibroid. And then you know exactly where to make the incision. Like in this particular case, there's a fibroid here, but I don't know. Then I can cut the fibroid and then remove the fibroid to remove it and then repair it. So these are strategies for locating fibroids. So if you have many fibroids uh, and you're unsure as to whether your, the fibroid, there's still one fibroid left behind, you can use one of these techniques. Okay, let me go on to the next uh, problem challenge is a previous myomectomy. Now, this is an example of a lady who had a previous myomectomy. You see, when you have a previous myomectomy, bowel is always stuck very badly. And in this particular case, I actually went into the bowel because although I was trying to cut in between, uh, the additions were so bad that I actually went into the uh, went into the bowel. So when you have a patient who has a previous myomectomy and you have to do a re-laparoscopic myomectomy or even a hysterectomy, be very careful. Uh, in this particular case, I made a small hole in the bowel, as you can see here. Uh, there's a small hole in the bowel. Here's an old video, and you see there's a small hole. And uh, so, and then I have to repair this bowel. So whenever you have a patient with previous myomectomy, be careful that you may have bowel injury and, and always be very careful when you are dissecting. Okay, another challenge is operating on Virgo intact patients. So Virgo intact patients do not want any manipulation of the uterus. You will have to have uh, some skills to do cases like this. Now, use more than four pots because you don't have a uterine manipulator. Uh, don't just try it. Some people work with three. I, 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 you always work with four. You can put a fifth pot and that fifth pot can be, uh, you can put in a myoma screw and hold the uterus up. So don't be hesitant to put in another pot. Use a myoma screw or spiral, or you can use a laparoscopic tenaculum and that can hold up the uterus for you. Use suture to hang the uterus when suturing, especially when the posterior wall incision. I will show you an example. Like this patient has got a, a, a nice posterior fibroid. So the fibroid was enucleated. And after enucleation of the fibroid, um, the enucleated fibroid, I wanted to suture. And if I want the, my, my assistant to hold on to the uterus, it will waste one, uh, one uh, what you call one hand. So what I do is I use this proline stitch and I just hook it up into the abdomen. And by hooking this up, you can have the uterus hanging and then you can suture your uh, defect easily. So you, you save one hand and your assistant can then assist you in, when, you're, when you're operating. This is the same case that I showed you all just now. I use interrupted suture to, to cover this. So uh, use sutures to as, as, a, as an adjunct for your surgery. Okay, bleeding during laparoscopic myomectomy. I think this is probably the most feared 
uh, a problem during laparoscopic myomectomy. Sorry, I will go to. Uh, so first of all, be prepared for bleeding. If you think it's going to be difficult, it is better to isolate and tie up the uterine artery at the beginning. Sometimes it is not easy because you have the fibroid sitting on the area where you have to uh, tie up the uterine artery. So you can actually, what you can do is you can enucleate the fibroid first and then go and look for the arteries and, and tie it up. It's not necessary that you must do it at the beginning. You can do it and in between as well. So it will help your bleeding to be lesser. Coagulate active bleeders as you are cutting and enucleating the fibroid. So sometimes when you are pulling a fibroid, there's an active bleeder. You can coagulate it immediately. Uh, that, that is another advice. When there are multiple fibroids, sometimes it's better to do one fibroid at a time. Suture the defect before going to the next fibroid. Now, vasopressin only works for 45 minutes. So what you do, like the case I showed you all earlier, you have two big fibroids. Remove the first fibroid and suture the defect first, and then go to the next fibroid. That will, will, will save you a lot of bleeding and a lot of time. Be very quick in your suturing. I mean, my assistants always tell me that when I'm doing fibroids, I'm very, very fast because I know that the, the vasopressin is only going to work for 20, 45 minutes and I have to finish off everything before that. So you want to remove the fibroid and suture as quickly as possible. Remember that you can re-inject vasopressin. So if you have injected vasopressin and then the, you have done the fibroid and then it's bleeding, you can go and inject again. And uh, so this, this can be done. Sometimes you are unaware of the amount of bleeding when you're busy suturing and the, uh, the patient as in the transverse position, blood will be accumulated around the liver and spill. Always talk to your anesthetist. It has happened to me many, many times. I'm busy, happily suturing and uh, there's a lot of oozing. And at the end of the surgery, I realized the patient already lost 1,000 uh, 1, or 1,500 cc of blood. So be very aware that it is uh, it, uh, when you're doing myomectomy, especially when you're doing multiple fibroids and multiple incisions, the little, little oozing can accumulate to be a lot. And you need to uh, tell the anesthetist to watch out for low blood pressure. And always get blood cross mesh when you're doing large and multiple fibroids. I don't, I don't cross mesh for all my fibroids, but if I think it's big and I think it's going to bleed, I will have some blood cross mesh. Now, the last, this is my last slide. I don't know whether I went beyond my time. Um, Mosulation, mosulator not working. This happened to me just two weeks ago. Uh, my mosulator was not working. This is a mosulator that I was using for the last 10 years. It's a rotocut by uh, Stotts. And I realized that uh, they told me that this is no more in production and no more in service. That means you're not going to get any more mosulators. I've been trying to ask around to see whether any other company makes a reusable mosulators, but most companies say it's no because there's no more market for mosulators. So I have to go on to use uh, uh, disposable mosulator. So this is a Versato from uh, from India, and this is a Lina from uh, from the, the Lina company. So you may have to have this standby. So now I've started using this for my mosulation. Okay, thank you, and thanks for your patience. Back to you, Trilin.